relationship to the non-human, to non-humans, and trying to challenge the common sense, embracing the paradoxical. So that's why we're called non-human nonsense. And our background is that we are from Stockholm in Sweden, uh, where I was studying industrial design as my BA, and Leo was studying physics. And then we kind of met in the middle and started to work together and did our master at Central St. Martins in London uh, at the course called Material Futures. And now we are in Berlin where we have our studio as well. And we are here today to talk about one of our projects which is, which is called the Pink Chicken Project. And we will start by showing you a three minute long film. <laughs> Chicken projects suggest changing the colour of the entire species, Gallus gallus domesticus, to pink. Why? Human actions have altered the earth so profoundly that we have entered a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. The stability of the biosphere is threatened, with an uncomfortably high probability of an uninhabitable planet within the next century. This devastation will leave traces in the strata for geologists of the future, such as plastic pollution, soot from power stations, nuclear fallout, and surprisingly, the fossilized bones of the global proliferation of the domestic chicken. The bones of the 60 billion chickens that we kill every year leave a geographically widespread, stratigraphically restricted, and morphologically distinct trace in the strata. To reoccupy this identifier of our age, we will genetically modify a chicken with pink bones and feathers, using a gene from the insect cochineal to produce a pigment that will be fossilized when combined with the calcium of the bone. And with the recently invented CRISPR gene drive technique, 100% of the offspring of our genetically modified pink chicken will inherit our modifications. Planting eggs at chicken farms around the world, the pink gene is estimated to reach all chicken in just 12 to 19 generations, thus permanently altering the entire species, Gallus gallus domesticus, and colouring the stratum of the Anthropocene pink. The chicken also carries a message in its DNA, encoded into A's, T's, G's and C's, a time capsule readable for thousands of years. We, the humans of planet Earth, write this message at the beginning of the Anthropocene. The current devastation of the planet is not the result of activities undertaken by the whole species of Homo sapiens. Instead, it derives from a small group of humans in power. We urge you to fight this oppression, for it enables and aggravates the anthropocentric violence forced upon the non-human world. Sent in hope that you have reimagined us as a biological organism. Help us accelerate this effort by ordering your own pink egg. The traces of humanity is no longer in the hands of Monsanto and Dupont, the radiation of nuclear bombs or the oil spills of ExxonMobil, but also in yours. So the Pink Chicken Project is a suggestion somewhere between utopia and dystopia. And it's a story intended to create a critical discourse on gene drives and other biotechnologies, linking ecological and social justice, uh, trying to access the underlying ethical and political issues. And we're asking questions like, what relationship do we want to have to other species? And also, what's the effect of this relationship? And for us, the project started with the concept of the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is the suggested new era or epoch that we are in now. And the word Anthropocene means human era. And it replaces the Holocene, which lasted the last 11,000 years, which is all of human history. And the Holocene was a very stable epoch. So basically, geologists are saying that we have modified the planet so profoundly that the Earth system as a whole has exited the normal variations of the Holocene. We have crossed the planetary boundaries of stability and are now entering uncharted territory. So the Anthropocene is an epoch that's defined by ecological disaster on a planetary scale. 
There is a group of geologists called the Anthropocene Working Group that's trying to formalize the stratigraphic signals uh, of the Anthropocene. So we went to Leicester in the UK, where they're looking for a golden spike or a measurable identifier of this ecological collapse that will be visible for millions of years. And they told us that they have some candidates, plastic pollution, suits from power stations, nuclear fallout, but also to our surprise, chicken bones. So chickens is the most common bird on the planet. And we kill so many chickens every year, 60 billion, that it uh, cover the earth in a layer of bones that will be then seen in the, as a layer in the mountains. So we thought if we color the, uh, all chicken bones pink, uh, we could change the trace of humanity, the change that humanity is leaving behind. So by coloring all chicken bone pinks, we can reoccupy the stratum, which is now occupied by plastic and nuclear fallout. So it's a way of creating a pink spike with a message of resistance to future generations. And we uh, coloring all bones of all chickens sounds kind of impossible or very, very hard to us. And while we were doing this project, we were working together with a Syn Bio Lab uh, at Imperial College in London. So we came to them with this uh, suge suggestion and that we wanted to make a scenario about coloring all the chickens in the world pink. And we came there without any hope that it would be possible, kind of. But they, to our surprise, they told us uh, that it might actually be possible but with this new, very controversial technology called gene drive. Now, gene drives, uh, as you may know, is a way to genetically modify not just a single individual, but an entire species. Or rather, it's a way to greatly accelerate the spread of a genetic modification so that it uh, can reach an entire population. Without a gene drive, only 50% of the offspring of your modified organism will carry a genetic trait, so that over generations, your modification will quickly disappear. But with the gene drive, 100% of the offspring will carry the modification, forcing a specific genetic trait uh, to spread to an entire population, something that can happen theoretically over just 12 to 19 generations. Gene drives are based on CRISPR, which is another breakthrough technology that makes it easy and cheap to modify genes. A gene drive is created by embedding the CRISPR machinery itself into your modified individual so that an offspring of a pink chicken and a wild chicken will carry two chromosomes of a specific site, one containing the drive and one of the wild type. The drive containing one contains a CRISPR system that will cut the wild type chromosome, causing it to repair with the pink chromosome as a template, and therefore modifying uh, the, like the chromosome inside the embryo of the offspring, so that the offspring contains two uh, pink drive-containing chromosomes, and therefore the process continues over generations. So theoretically, to color all chickens pink, you now only need a single modified pink chicken that's equipped with a gene drive. And over 12 to 19 generations, which for chickens in factory farms is just a few years, you can modify an entire species on a global scale. So needless to say, this is a very powerful technology and there are activists that are discouraging its use that have compared it or called it biology's nuclear weapon. But contrary to nuclear weapons, because it's based on CRISPR, the procedure is not complicated, it does not require advanced equipment and the regions and DNA sequences are cheap. But the Pink Chicken Project attempts to use this powerful technology to create a discussion on power. Because even though the geological epoch is called uh, the Anthropocene and the chicken bones are the prime identifier of this geological epoch, the Anthropocene, which means the human era, hides the fact, or the name the Anthropocene hides the fact that the destabilization of the earth is not caused equally by all human beings. The failure to prevent disaster is deeply enabled and aggravated by structures of power and cultures of oppression. Structures that are embedded in social injustices, such as patriarchy, heterosexism, racism, and the heritage of colonialism. So pink is a symbolic color, 
It's culturally coded as an opposition to the heteromasculine supremacy that drives the anthropocentric violence currently forced upon non-human worlds. The project manifesto, talking about this link between social and ecological justice, is encoded into the DNA of the pink chicken. Because just like information in a computer can be stored in zeros and ones, it is possible to store information in the basis of DNA, the A's, T's, G's, and C's. DNA is in fact a very stable molecule, so it's suggested to be a viable long-term storage of information. So this message would be readable by future humans for thousands of years, embedded into the strata of the Earth's crust. So every time you see a pink chicken or a pink stone, you can know that it carries a message of social justice. So um, the pink the pink color, where does it come from then? Uh, the gene making the pink pigment comes from an insect that is called cochineal, which produces a natural dye called carminic acid, which is also a common food addi additive. So the pink uh, chickens would also be safe to eat. And the reason that broiler chickens are such a good geological identifier is because they're geographically widespread. So it's the same chicken all over the world with very little genetic difference. It's stratigraphically restricted, which means that the broiler only appeared very recently. And it's also morphologically distinct. So uh, chickens or their bodies don't look like their ancestors anymore. So if you compare an ancient chicken, like this red jungle fowler on the left, with a selectively bred modern broiler on the right, you see that they're so optimized for meat growth that in their short uh, six weeks lifespan, they develop joint problems and bone fractures and bone twists. And in fact, if they live beyond their six weeks, the mortality rate increases by 50%. They have heart attacks, their body collapses under its own weight, basically. Broilers live in climate-controlled houses that are strictly sealed off to prevent bacteria and viruses from spreading. So broilers are completely dependent on modern technology, and chicken bones are in that sense technologically made objects. Just like this uh, fossilized box of eggs, the boundary between nature and culture, natural and unnatural, is dissolving, if such a boundary ever existed. So we are continuously reshaping the path of evolution with our choices and everything that we will do today will construct the stones of tomorrow. In this project, we're not trying to tell people what to think, but we're trying to create an open discussion from multiple perspectives and also create a story that enables more people to take, care, uh, take part in the debate, not only experts. We're asking question, how does the violence of gene drives compare to the ongoing violence on factory farming? And the product exists uh, on different places, for example, uh, at art and design exhibitions like this one, where you can explore a possible future with pink chickens by seeing and uh, being in the same room as the object. And it also exists online, uh, where it's framed as an activist campaign or a startup idea where you can read about the science of gene drives and the power structures of the Anthropocene. And also on the website, you can declare your interest in ordering a pink egg to spread the project. So through the website, we have received hundreds of messages from people all over the world where they describe how it made them feel. If it made them feel informed, inspired, distressed, angry, or scared. And although the product hasn't uh, genetically modified any chickens and uh, doesn't say that it has either. The language and the images are intentionally ambiguous. So we're seeking to uh, we're seeking a balance between being thought provoking and believable, but not directly deceptive. So we're trying to create an informed debate. And in some cases, uh, it's harder. <laughs> like uh, it's more difficult. Like in this one, which is an anti-GMO site on Facebook, where many people respond with their gut reaction. But after a while, people are urging them to look closer and think again. Um, so we don't have the full control over the discussion or how the product is read. Uh, another forum we've been in, in uh, it has been used, is at the United Nations. 
where under the Convention of um, the Biological Diversity, there are 196 governments, international bodies and representatives of business, education, NGOs and science that are trying to agree on international regulations if gene drives should at all be legal, and if so, how? Currently, uh, that discourse is almost completely focused around uh, another possible use case of gene drives to combat vector-borne diseases like malaria, Zika, and chikungunya. So by releasing a gene drive mosquito that would be immune to these vectors, or um, also possibly by modifying them to only have male offspring, you could then uh, eradicate this entire species of mosquitoes and therefore eradicate the diseases. And malaria is one of the deadliest diseases on the planet. So if this works, it would save millions of human lives every year. But the critics are saying that uh, this involves enormous risks for ecosystems, which are very difficult to estimate beforehand. And that we should not assess the impact of the technology based only on the best possible use case. So accredited by our university in London, we went to the COP14 meeting in Egypt and presented the pink chicken as another possible use case. As chicken bones are one of the main markers of the Anthropocene, this intervention would modify the future fossil record, coloring the geological trace of humankind pink. The United Nations is a very uh, polarized forum where there are very big interests and very big money also involved. And the discussions can at times be very technical. So it's not really a place where people with opposing worldviews can sit down and try to understand each other and have the very difficult ethical discussions that need to be had. But um, being a funny project, the response that uh, we had was that delegates came to us and asked us to explain the technology and the ethical dilemmas because it seems that humor allows a, a different type of conversation to be had. And also to our surprise, uh, both of the sides were enthusiastic about the pink chicken and expressed the relief that finally they could uh, have a chance to talk about the ethics or politics, which they, is what, what they want to discuss. Because when legislators, experts, and communities are faced with a new technology, it's often too early or too late to have a constructive discourse on how to approach that new power. Too early because the possible risks are just vague speculation, or too late because society is already heavily invested or dependent on the technologies. It's also assumed that um, the technologies are going to be used by someone. It's a, sort of like, if we don't do it, then China is going to do it. So this lack of trust means that there isn't really an opportunity to stop and slow things down. So big countries are pushing to gain technological advantage and small countries are eager for investment in their communities. So in this complex situation, legislators are currently looking to science for answers. There are, for example, these ad hoc technical expertise groups on risk, which I think Todd has been a part of also, I don't know that are tasked with uh, giving the best answers that science can give on what the, the risks of the technology is. To which they respond that it's not the technology per se, but it's, and it doesn't make sense to ban whole technology, but it has to be assessed on a case by case basis. And then science does its very best at making an assessment of, uh, of the situation, which there are many things that are basically unknowable. We can do experiments in lab environments, of course, but they don't reflect the complexity of, say, um, the ecosystem of the entire African continent. We can look at data and models from epidemiology, but if COVID-19 has shown us anything, maybe is that these models, they are often much better at predicting the past than they are at predicting the future. So because science is cautionary and only makes statements that are evidence-based, there is a tendency to systematically underestimate risk, which creates a sense that the technologies and that the world maybe is under our control, whereas it might be much more wild or unbounded. So at the UN, the pink chicken becomes another possible future with gene drives, showing that there will be many unexpected uses of the technology, and many of them we can't yet imagine. 
and it attempts to redirect focus to the more long-term impacts of the technology. How are gene drives affecting the power balance in our relationship to other species? Because in the end, the United Nations also becomes a forum that's centered around global politics and power, where the countries with military or monetary muscles are the ones who set the agenda. So in the end, it comes down to very fundamental issues uh, of justice or philosophy, like uh, whose voices are being heard, for example. So the next step for us in this project is that we're currently working on a book for an exhibition in New York in April, uh, where we've reached out to many uh, philosophers, scientists, uh, thinkers and activists to try to use the project as a backdrop for a debate on these uh, like philosophical or ethical questions that, um, that we want to um, facilitate. And this is one of the quotes from the interviews that we've had. Are technologies like gene drive going to remedy some of the problems of technology or modernity? Or might they go awry in some unpredictable kind of ways? So the Pink Chicken product urges us to zoom out to your logical timescales and think about both biotechnologies and our role on the planet in the face of deep time. And ask us the question, are we being good ancestors? Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna um, open it up for discussion now. So just a reminder, you can either type in your question into the chat box, which I'll um, read out loud, or if you'd like to ask your questions live, which we definitely encourage, um, use the raise hand function and we will uh, call on you there. Um, so we have a, a basic question um, that just came in from Paul, and um, which is, can a gene drive be used to undo a gene drive? Um, and I would add on to that, you know, how would you guys also think about that from sort of how you're utilizing this, this um, you know, thoughtful art project um, as well? Uh, yeah, so there are, there are people that are saying that it is possible to undo a gene drive with another gene drive. So then maybe one uh, scenario or one ethical issue that can, can come, come up is that there are also risks that people can uh, weaponize the technology um, to, for example, uh, knock out an ecosystem in a certain country, for example. And the DARPA, the United States uh, like Experimental um, Defense Department, have said that they, at one point they said that they're going all out to try to weaponize the technology and they're spending... They committed something like a hundred million dollars to to gene drive research. So then you can, uh, I'm, I mean, it's you don't need so much imagination to imagine that you can uh, have the situation where someone releases a, a gene drive and then someone else releases like an anti gene drive to try to revert those changes. So um, I don't know. It just quickly becomes very speculative, but also very um, like there's there's. I think that there is something to the discussion that the technology is, has geopolitical ramifications somehow. Okay, great. We have a question from Eli who's, who says, even though the project is based on discussion, you show that having some experiential and visual aids has helped people engage. If presented the opportunity, would you choose to have one or two real living pink chickens made as an aid for your project? Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> so, yeah, this is maybe another interesting question in the sense that what we're doing is to try to use speculation to, to create a discussion uh, on a future. And I guess then it becomes a question of how much do we want to push that speculation or where do we uh, draw the line? Like, do we, would we be okay with maybe modifying just one? Uh, uh, like chicken, you know, or having a gene drive chicken that's in kept in a cage somewhere. And I think that um, for us, maybe we're trying to um, maybe draw the line of not actually modifying any uh, individuals or modifying any any organisms. And um, I think that the reason is also because there's this debate that if you're using speculation. Uh, at some point, you're also reinforcing the future that you're trying to critically discuss somehow. So 
So we're not trying to go too far, I guess, into that uh, direction. Yeah, so what we have done is that we've been working with a, a taxidermist in London who's working for the Natural History Museum, who has done like speculative species before and uh, creating images that looks like it's true. Yeah. yeah, and at the same time, we've also uh, engaged with synthetic biologists to see uh, if the speculation is relevant and if it's scientifically grounded. Uh, but because it's a speculation, there's always some level of uh, uh, like uh, uncertainty to it, you know, because we haven't done it. It's not um, sure exactly how to do it, but that's the, the tool of speculation, I guess. Okay, great. Uh, Dalton, uh, you should be unmuted, so uh, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for presenting this today. Such a fascinating um, project. Um, really admire how um, how this project is blend is using uh, art and science to say something larger about um, social justice and the future of humanity. This is really great stuff. Um, and it just a quick anecdote reminded me of my first semester archaeology class as a freshman at university, where my professor made a joke about how if a alien species came to Earth, you know, a million years or so in the future, and we were extinct, and they looked back on this period of history, they would think that cows and chickens actually ruled the world, um, based on the fossil record. Um, but my question is, um, I'm just wondering if you could maybe go into um, some more specifics about some of the most prevalent questions and concerns that um, the two of you have heard directly from uh, UN delegates in your experiences at COP. Thanks. Mm. You mean current specifically around the risks of it? Or like anything that the delegates have, uh, we can't hear you now, maybe you're muted again. So specifically... Uh, yeah, so yeah, um, just generally like in response to what you present at these UN meetings, you mentioned there was a lot of questions about the technology itself and yeah. some more general like ideas about how it can be used and the risks with that. but. Um, Maybe in response to some of the more, uh, like, are these UN delegates coming up with their own questions that surprised you or concerns relative to their own contexts um, about these topics that surprise you? Just kind of stuff like that, anything that comes yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, we were at the UN and listened to the, the like, public discussions that are sort of the official uh, things that the country can that the countries can say, and we also went to the closed discussions in something that's called the contact groups, which is where uh, no one is allowed to record what's being said, and that the countries can sort of speak more openly or freely about what they actually think and how they negotiate on these things. And we also spoke to uh, privately to some of the delegates to see like what their uh, views are and what their knowledge were and. I guess our feeling was um, partially also that the delegates or many of the delegates at least are uh, very, very well informed and very uh, skilled and like sort of very wise in trying to navigate these very complex discussions. But that when it comes to the actual statements that they're doing, there's a lot of influence about the power and that there's a lot of negotiating from the delegates, which are usually maybe uh, biologists or conservationists and they are sort of um, all the time like in communication with their governments maybe who have certain political agendas or um, have very specific like um, maybe interests that they're trying to protect and then on the other hand there are also um, many people at the UN maybe who are, are not so informed that uh, how the technologies work and there are strong uh, groups trying to influence them, like these, uh, like very big corporations, for example, that are um, like trying to push them in a certain direction. And then the the, the negotiations are 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 sort of like uh, in the end, it comes down to things like um, there's a, a statement from. The, some African countries saying that they want to do it in a specific way and then there are some other countries saying like, oh yeah, because if you follow in this discussion, you know that the African countries are the ones that are going to be um, affected first. So we should listen to what they're saying. So it's, it's this very sort of basic 
who who do you trust and uh, the the whole uh, discussion i think is um, uh, kind of messy maybe or what would you say i mean mm-hmm. i think that uh, there's a lot of like uh, politics and risks and things just going on in in all directions or that was our impression i mean we're not uh, experts on exactly how the different countries are uh, what their views are and how the negotiations are going because we're just trying to observe them from the outside but uh, i guess what we're just trying to do is to 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 try to make them think more long term about um you know how is these technologies shifting uh, like the power balance to our uh, to other species you know or how do we want to re- relate to other species basically i hope that answers your question somehow Messy is a nice way of putting how the UN negotiations go. Um, yeah. uh, so we have a, a, a comment and a question from uh, Professor Kuzma. So she first says, brilliant, and, and thank you. And then her question is, have you thought about patenting or other intellectual property protections for your project? And how might that spark additional conversation over ownership? Yeah, yeah that's a good uh, idea. And we have heard that idea also before. Um, but uh, I don't know if we should say anything more because when you apply for a patent, you're not allowed to divulge your uh, invention because then it's not patentable anymore. So I don't know if we can have any more comments on that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it would be an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, we're looking into that. Yeah, but maybe one thing to say is that uh, I mean, with these new technologies, there is also um, sometimes people who are trying to be as quick as possible in, in patenting, you know, these different speculative ideas about how uh, the technology could be used. Like, for example, there was this very speculative idea that was granted to someone about um, putting laser beams on bees or something like that to uh, not, like to navigate as pollinators or something. But so that sometimes um, the patent system sort of uh, slips through these ideas that are very speculative. So. But it is at least, you know, that's maybe one way of uh, pushing the project in being something that's more um, believable or or real somehow, because people think patents are real. And ownership is also interesting. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Dylan, um, who says, the idea of leaving a message to future peoples in DNA is interesting. I wonder how you would make sure they understand how to translate the cipher. Have you thought about that issue and how it could be solved? It seems to me you would need some kind of Rosetta Stone. Um, yeah, so there maybe this so this part of the project we've used um, a scientific paper that suggests a standard of encoding of how to store information in the DNA. So that there are different encodings. So any any information can be stored in, in different ways. And someone a few years ago suggested that they found the most efficient way to uh, store information in DNA using an algorithm that they call DNA fountain or something like that, which like very tightly packs information into the DNA. Um, so maybe we are just speculating that maybe in a future where... Um, DNA sequencing would be much more available or ubiquitous, then maybe there would be some sort of standard of how to encode information or how to read that information. Yeah, but also on the other hand, if they can't read our letters, then yeah. it's also uh, this message is also as much a message to the present as it is for the future. So in the scenario, it's also a message to now, of course. Yeah. Okay, we have a, a question from Aaron who, who's concerned that his connection was poor, but he's he's asking if the essence of the project is to serve as a geological mark for future humans. Um, and is there anything I've, I've that I must have missed on the essence of the project? Um, yeah, I guess so. The essence of the project is to enable a discourse on trying to link uh, social and ecological justice. So trying to link maybe the ecological disaster of the Anthropocene with these growing or changing powers of biotechnology. And by that sense, maybe trying to, um, yeah, just think about that in the core of it sometimes is, is how we relate to other species. Yeah, and also the product is has a lot of layers and a lot of complexity, and it's not 
like super easy to grasp, uh, which is also a way of discussing how the current um, time is also very complex, I guess. Yeah. It's a different system in crisis at the same time. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is to allow the, uh, the complex world to remain complex in the scenario somehow and not um, go towards the simplifying. Okay, great. So uh, Amanda is, um, is giving you more praise, which is absolutely deserved. Uh, so such an interesting project, and I love the connection between art and science. Has it sparked other conversations about factory farming? Mm. Mm. I think that uh, maybe I'm thinking about this letter that we got from MIT. What do you think? Is, uh, mm -hmm. So um, maybe one conversation is that we reached out to one of the um, scientists that is uh, one of the sort of scientists that invented the gene drive and um, he said, or like asked what his view on the project was. And he is one of the ones that's working on uh, trying to uh, use it also to eradicate malaria. And he basically said that uh, he thought that factory farming was really one of the most uh, terrible things that humanity sort of is engaging in at the moment. Um, but that uh, it sort of, up, it sort of, uh, upweighed or not the factory farming but the use of gene drives to him was really strongly motivated by uh, the amount of human lives that could be saved if it was used on gene drives so uh, maybe that's the thing on factory farming maybe another thing also is that through the website we've gotten many of these uh, letters from people all over the world yeah many of them is from farmers actually yeah and uh, but they're not from like big factory farms i think no. they're most like it's different like some of them are from uh people who are like oh i have a little farm i'm ready to go send me an egg now and others are more like oh i'm an educator uh this is really thoughtful and and uh, i'm really using it to like have a discussion with my students some other people are like oh i'm a scientist working with these questions um, in the lab so um, this is also something that we plan to include somehow in the book that we're working on. Yeah, I think like for the book that we should also have more discussions within farming and agriculture. Yeah. That's true. Oh, yeah. John is asking, have you faced much pushback or disengagement because of the implications on the current diet of developed countries? On a similar note, have you mapped where the world would turn pink? Mm -hmm. I mm. guess the funny thing I was thinking about, we had an exhibition in South Korea and there they eat a lot of chickens. So there it was very, it was, you could see that it was much more that people could really relate to this thing that we eat so many chickens, I think. Yeah, they were like, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 we eat so many <laughs> But I don't know if that was the answer. I was just thinking about that. It was really funny. Yeah. Um... But maybe, I mean, one thing that's interesting to us about the link to food culture is that uh, the chicken somehow seem to be really at the center of, of, the, the, of the Anthropocene somehow because uh, uh, they, they were also part of this uh, green revolution where by, you know, being able to industrially create fertilizers, we were then able to also create this number of chickens, which then also led to this great uh, increase in population on the planet, which now also part, like contributes to creating a lot of the problems. So it's, uh, I don't know, to us, it's really interesting how the, the chicken is sort of tied into many of these uh, uh, systems that are in crisis at the same time. So it's, that's why it's also so difficult to solve somehow that it's, uh, it's a crisis around climate, but it's also around uh, like loss of uh, biodiversity and also a crisis around phosphorus, not being able to mine any more phosphorus and also a crisis around food production and food quality. So there are many, many um, crises at the same time, which is what makes it so difficult. Okay, Professor Rossano is asking, so I am sure the pink chicken technology has generated conversation. However, has the discussion been slanted against biotechnology, particularly in the EU, 
since the prospects of changing the fossil record with a change in chicken color is nonsensical? Do you follow up with useful examples of the useful uses of biotechnology for humanity or discuss risks as well? Slanted, what is it slanted? What does that mean? That's mm-hmm. like leaning towards something, or? Uh, yeah, so has the, has the discussion been more about the sort of the negative implications of biotech in the EU based on your project? Hmm. Mm. I'm not really sure. I think that maybe this is something that, I mean, what happened with the, I think that this is an interesting thing that people are very, um, maybe nervous or very strongly, there's something that's really strongly charged with this discussion on gene drives, that what happened with the the GMO debate um, is sort of something that people don't want to happen again, where the, like, the big companies like Monsanto, for example, um, went out and and really used it for like maybe these sort of nefarious profit motivated um, uses. And then there's this kind of strong opposition towards uh, GMOs, which is maybe also what uh, what we saw when we posted it on or when it was posted on some of these Facebook anti-GMO sites, for example. And I think that part of those gut reactions is maybe because it's a little bit of uh, an echo chamber that uh, people maybe didn't actually see the project. They just saw the title of the uh, article and then maybe they reacted immediately somehow. But I think that part of it is also maybe because the ethical views or the world views are, are kind of polarized. Uh, so that something that like people have these very strong visceral reactions because uh, they ethically stand very um, far apart from each other at the moment. And uh, I think what we're trying to do is to show this specific example, which uh, we are trying to create that is not only negative or not only positive, but trying to be somewhere in between. And I think that there are many other people that are already uh, showing examples that are the most positive ones, like maybe using it for malaria, for example, and also activists that are taking up the most negative ones, you know, like maybe it would be weaponized or that it will end up in agriculture and then Monsanto will do it again to sort of resensitize crops to Roundup and and those kind of scenarios. So we're trying to be um, somewhere in between. I guess. Yeah, and I feel like the like messages we have got from the website that they are on on every different level. There are different scales, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. We have a couple of questions on on the the color, actually. So let me ask a couple, and then I'll let you guys respond. So um, Sebastian is asking, have you considered other colors in terms of the message and its symbolic meaning? And then Carrie follows up um, with, what's the symbolism in having pink chickens, chicken bones, opposed to another color, like black or something less vibrant? And how do you see pink as antithetical to, to anthropogenic climate change, factory farming, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, I think for us, it was kind of uh, immediate that it would be pink. And I don't think we really considered any other color. I think when we first uh, came up with the idea, we were like, hmm, maybe we could uh, change it to another color. And then we thought for a second. And then I remember us looking at each other and saying like pink at the <laughs> same time. A sort of uh, a something that is uh, would be sort of yeah self evident or a good choice somehow and uh, pink as a, a color or the cultural significance of that color um, is of course different in different cultures of the world but uh, where we come from it's something that's very strongly colored or uh, coded as a feminine color yeah and that's also we find that interesting because all the chickens are also female yeah. So it's a kind of an oppression on a lot of females. (laughs) So the color pink is a way to discuss how the current traces that humanity is leaving behind, maybe it's really entangled into uh, this patriarchy, basically, that there are these power structures that are um, reinforcing or uh, enabling um, the destruction of of the world in some sense. And that... um, 
labeling it pink or making it pink is sort of a, a gesture at uh, um, criticizing those power structures. So just another uh, color question. So Jamie is, is commenting and asking, so perhaps because pink is a vibrant artificial color, it goes hand in hand with us trying to change up nature to our liking? Yeah, that's also true. Um, so Eli is asking, have you had any contact with the people who are trying to make a dinosaur chicken? No. Dinosaur chicken? Who's I don't think so. I don't know who that is. No, I don't have, I haven't heard about but it. But I would love to have that. <laughs> yeah. I'll write it down. Uh, so Andy is asking, um, can you tell us a bit about your creative process? I'm also very curious about how you built your collaborations with different research and policy groups. Were the reactions you received generally positive and supportive when you first pitched the idea of the Pink Chicken Project? Or did you face any pushback on your vision? So in our creative process, I like to start with when we collaborate with people, I, I found like that people are very positive, much more positive, like in within the field of speculative design, it can be a, a lot of critique, like, oh, what is this good for? Why are we doing this? And this is real change. But then when we go outside that little bubble of people are in this field, I feel like people are always like, oh, we really need images and we really need scenarios and we need, uh, right? Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And in our creative process, we work a lot with, we often start with what we want to discuss or what we want the product to be about. So in this product, we, we knew that we wanted to, and we also, in this project, uh, we, we had this collaboration already with the Imperial College. Yeah. And so we started with this, um, we started with this quote of reoccupying the stratum. So, because we were already in the field of like the Anthropocene and we wanted to discuss power somehow. And we knew that it was within Synbio. Yeah. Right. But the process also is, uh, I guess, something that we've been trained in quite a lot. I yeah. mean, you have uh, uh, three years of design and thinking and design methodology, and then we studied two years in London as well. So it's, uh, I guess, it's uh, not a complicated process, but it's really uh, something that we've uh, trained specifically. I guess. Yeah, and it takes a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, it, it takes a lot of time also, I think, to understand the science and to understand the field enough to be able to create the project that is, um, complex or allows for complexities or have these layers. So um, we have also been in IGEM actually uh, a few years before we did this project and sort of uh, thought about these questions of power biotechnology or engaged in them for a while. So it takes a while before we can do a good project, I think. Yeah, so what we did was that we are like uh, on a more like practical term that we have these things we want to discuss and then do ideations and then maybe have a couple of different scenarios or ideas and then we go into experts and talk to them about them, which one is, which one should we go further with and then we do some prototypes and then when we have the scenario, so we, we had the scenario and then we were like, we can understand that this scenario about coloring all chicken spring is about a lot of things but we're not really sure about what. So then we did another, like, we were like, oh, this and this and this people are in farming or biotech or like uh, power structures. And then we go out with the product again to talk to them and then back again and then create new prototypes and new images and new, yeah. yeah. And we're in that process now again, that yeah. we make new objects and new for the book and also for another exhibition. So Jennifer is asking, how do you think perceptions about this technology changes with different applications? I guess I'm asking about how the usefulness of coloring chickens versus curing disease affects the perception of genetic engineering. I think that the stories that we are being told is like all that, I don't know, that it uh, affects our perception a lot, I guess. Yeah, I think maybe it for us it maybe like when thinking about technologies, people usually try to think about how it can solve problems, I guess. And uh, the R process is uh, maybe different that it's not trying to solve a certain problem with it with the technology, but rather to maybe find the problem or to use it as a reflection on the underlying ethical or the political issues that 
are what uh, we think sh- shape the world more than maybe the specific technologies on them. Yeah, and also what we find interesting is that maybe some people are trying to bind on bound uh, bind uncertainty, but what we are trying to do and maybe is to unbind or ah, you mean this the scenario yeah, planning thing? Exactly. Yeah. So there's this history of using speculation and using scenarios in military and also in business to try to grasp at a future that is uncertain and they are using speculation to try to um, you know make sense of the future and make better business decisions somehow but maybe what we're doing is the opposite of that you know trying to um, remain humble to the fact that many things are unknowable or that we know very little about things or trying to remind us that um, maybe we don't know as much as we think that we know. And also by doing one scenario we can show that there's a lot of other possible futures yeah. it's a way of also believing in change we think to create a lot of different stories maybe another interesting thing to note is that we spoke to one historian and he said that uh, in some sense uh, the pink chicken project is more uh, realistic than for example uh, using it on mosquitoes because if you look at historically it's it's the unexpected things that change the course of history it's the things that no one sort of expected that that then end up being the ones that uh, matter or the ones that change things. So even though it might not be specifically uh, pink chickens that is going to happen, it is. we're trying to remind us maybe that uh, it's uh, difficult to know what is going to happen. So we've got a time for a couple more. So this one is, I think, a, a, also a speculative question, but maybe not. Um, so one thing that I'm curious about is, is can you distinguish between the pink and incomplete cooked chicken? So I guess the question is whether the color would be um, in, impacted by cooking or not cooking the actual chicken in terms of the bones. Um, yeah, so the the scientific speculation, I guess, that we're engaging in in, in this part of the project is that we uh, like we have found papers saying that uh, there are, it is possible to find traces of um, pigments in uh, fossils. So it is possible to find like uh, traces of melatonin in certain dinosaur pigments, for example, where it would be possible to see those uh, colors over millions of years. And then at the same time, we've tried to find the natural pigment that is uh, uh, very stable. So carmine uh, that comes from this insect called cochineal is one that's the, uh, like very stable to be a natural pigment. But since we haven't uh, done the experiment, we don't know, of course, like how specifically it uh, would work or uh, how much color it would be or something like that. But um, speaking to our uh, science like advisors, they said that... Uh, with CRISPR, basically, you can target a certain part of the genome that would only be expressed in the bone cells or in the osteoblasts of the chickens, so that then if you have a gene coming from the insect carmine that produces this pigment, you can have that pigment be expressed uh, in certain uh, parts of uh, the chicken's body, I guess. Okay, so this will be the, the last question. Um, it's a follow-up to um, a previous question from Aaron. So he says, given the premise of the project, don't you think it perpetuates the already existing phenomenon that humans in the Anthropocene are causing an ecological imbalance? An argument would perhaps be drawn that this is a selfishly driven aspect. Um, Wouldn't there be a supposed friendly message that does not involve altering an entire species genome? Perhaps importantly, why is it necessary to send a message to future humans? Yeah, yeah, I think those are the very good questions. And those are, in some sense, the questions that we're trying to ask with the project also. So um, in the end, it's quite a paradoxical project, you know, we're trying to uh, criticize the violence on non-humans by uh, causing violence on non-humans. And... uh, I think that's because we don't uh, say really that we have any answers or any uh, easy answers at least on how this technology should be used, but rather by using these paradoxes or these contradictions, we're trying to create a story that can um, allow these discussions to take place. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Um, I want to thank you so very much for for joining us today. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, and I want to encourage everyone here to, to continue the conversation and, and please visit um, their website so you can join uh, the global conversation about this. Um, we look forward to your book that's coming out um, and hopefully more exhibitions, um, both on this project and other projects that you guys are working on. So thank you again so very much for joining us. Great. Thank, thank you. you so much. It's really, really fun to be here.